This session now um, has been titled The Arab Technocracy. Um, I recently heard on the radio a author uh, who's been chronicling the, the new super rich describe four categories of the super rich today. He, he, he split them up as such, the oligarchs, the bankers, the sheikhs, and finally, and most newly, the tech, techno, technoligarchs. <laughs> the Mark Zuckerbergs and every other 20-something billionaire who's gone from dorm to Davos in a matter of a few years, a bit like GCC yesterday. And uh, Haig called them the startup of art collectives, and I think, uh, I think that's rather apt. Um, so at the same time, it's worth reminding ourselves that back in the 20th century, if you can remember uh, such a distant time, a company, a company like Ford or Bell Laboratories employed, employed tens, if not even hundreds of thousands of workers, often in several locations across several continents, whereas tech startups can seem to survive on a few caffeine-fueled combatants. How does the math of that work? Who is doing what to whom? For how much and whose lives is it changing? And does it matter that you own nothing and that they own everything? To explore this and more, we have the head of business development at WAMDA, Roland Daher, and Global Art Forum's Ying to Sultan's Yang, Turi Munt. Will you please welcome Roland and Turi? Thank you. So when Roland and I met earlier today in the Starbucks, just to go back to coffee, um, of the Four Points Hotel, um, and st to imagine what we would talk about today. Roland said, you know, I go to a lot of tech conferences, and they don't usually start like this. They don't usually start framed in the way that Shimon has just done it. Absolutely. And, and I th which is why Global Art Forum is such fun. Um, so, WAMDA is a region-wide incubator, accelerator, these are all new words, they all need to have their own hashtags. Um, incubator, accelerator, um, enabler, funder, and many other things. Give us an overview of what evil things you do. Can I start by saying that I'm none of the four type of riches that, uh, <laughs> that you started with, and I don't own anything that you don't own. <laughs> and uh, Wanda is uh, a lot of the above, and none in some cases. So WAMDA is, is a platform to support and enable entrepreneurship uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we believe that there's a lot of potential in uh, you know, unlocking the energy of young people in this part of the world. And uh, we do that by building communities around technology, around innovation, in partnership with incubators, accelerators, venture capital funds, all the players of an ecosystem. So we're a big platform where everybody plugs and you know, we, we celebrate entrepreneurship, we promote it, we, we try to position it as a viable alternative for wealth, for opportunity. We try to guide people on you know, how to do it, to learn from each other, to promote what they are doing, uh, and to create a community online and offline. So we connect a lot of people through our events. We'll also do a lot of research uh, because it's an untapped uh, area. So you know, two years ago, there was basically no research about entrepreneurship in the region. And everybody was just like rushing to do things. And at one point, we believed that there should be data that guides a lot of these initiatives so that you know, uh, resources are not uh, wasted. And then one day we say, no, it's, uh, it's not going to work. So we also do that. Tell, you've been involved with Kuwait quite a lot. Yeah. It's very loud. Okay. So um, starting last year, uh, we, we started doing a lot of work in Kuwait. Uh, the Kuwait government had launched uh, the, the Kuwait National Fund for SME Development. And uh, in order to put the strategy for that fund, there was a need to do some kind of uh, ecosystem assessment. So have a deep dive into what's there today, 
uh, what's lacking, what's working, what's not, map the players, identify you know, opportunities, industries to focus on, uh, type of institutions that need to be empowered, others that need to be actually launched, and this is what Wanda did. Now, in the next phase, we, that, so the strategy of the fund has been uh, approved and is being implemented now, and we will also be part of it on, on the culture uh, building side. Just to make Schumann happy, will you tell us how big that fund is? I tried on purpose not to say it. <laughs> it's a two billion KD fund, but it's, it's targeted to uh, SMEs in general, so it's not only focusing on tech startups. If, if that's not a fetish bit, the inspired number, I don't know, I don't know what is. Um, would you give us a bit of an overview of how you think that the tech scene, the entrepreneurial startup scene in the Middle East has, has grown? Where does it start? Yeah, so Where are we now? I think uh, it all started, you know, I think a, a milestone was the Maktoub uh, deal with Yahoo. Uh, that was the first time where anyone, you know, like in the region understood what's the opportunity that lies behind building a tech startup and scaling it and then exiting. Um, it was the largest and until a couple of weeks ago when Talabat uh, was uh, acquired by Rocket Internet for uh, roughly $5 million difference between the two. These are the two biggest exit in, in the tech scene. Back then, if you go and you say, you know, the words entrepreneurs and tech startups to 10 random people, maybe two will, will have an idea what that means. And this is when WAMDA was launched and a lot of other initiatives in the region had started. And since then, a lot happened. So there are multiple things to look at. You could look at media coverage, for instance, from zero to today, like, you know, uh, you open any newspaper, any mainstream media uh, outlet, and you would see something about entrepreneurship and tech. And not enough, but there's at least a footprint. If you look at investment activity, uh, it has almost tripled. Uh, so our data goes between 2009 and 2012, it had tripled. And I think in 2013 and 2014, the same momentum had remained. Uh, the type of funders, for instance, has also maintained a steady um, uh, way up um, uh, trend. So you have now more venture capital funds, more angel investment network, more angel investors individually. Um, the number of deals have, uh, has uh, increased. So there is a lot of activity happening. Uh, you know, what's the impact of that? It's, it's still too early. So, you know, the success stories are, quite, are a handful in terms of exit, if you, if you define exit as the success, but at least there is activity happening in this space, and it is today one of the most um, active spaces uh, in the region. Roland, you just, you said until a couple of years ago, a few years ago, the word entrepreneurship was not so commonly used. It was George Bush, I think, who first fetishized entrepreneurship as a word. Isn't he say the French didn't have a word for it? <laughs> uh, so I, I suppose what I'm asking is, is that is it really a thing? I'm used in Silicon Roundabout in London to think about it as a thing, and you talk about it as a thing. But the history of the the region has been one of new business for some time. That I mean, you've, you've you've mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, perhaps put this into a slightly wider historical context. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if you look at the early days of the region, uh, if, you, if, you go, if you look at the Levant, uh, we always pride ourselves to have been, like, among the first traders of uh, modern history. And even on, in the Gulf, like, you know, all the, the main cities started on the back of trade. And the big families today, you know, at one point, you know, there was one entrepreneur who found an opportunity and, you know, whether... Uh, moving goods or providing a certain service. And yes, it, there was a culture of entrepreneurship. And then came oil. And, <laughs> and it disappeared. Uh, not disappeared, but like, you know, the, the comfort zone that was created by oil and by the, the, the prices going up despite some um, crisis here and there, 
uh, over a couple of generations, it, it slowed down on uh, the, the native uh, entrepreneurial um, uh, you know, uh, spirit. And this is why, if you look at, uh, at numbers, the number of businesses that start in the Levant and North Africa is much bigger than those that are started by uh, GCC uh, nationals. And, and although there is no like, you know, proper data on that, you could argue that this is because people out, the, out there don't have an alternative. Okay. Whereas you know, here, until recently in many countries, just by the fact that you are born a national of a privileged uh, country with enough resources, you were entitled to, okay. you know, four-fifths of the Maslow pyramid by default. So, Okay, so m m moving away from where we're at in concrete terms, right now, in non-concrete terms, we are very, very, very post-Arab Spring. Um, this Arab Spring, which, one, is a hideous word, and two, was supposedly invented by California in the shape of Twitter and Facebook, etc. A lot of that has now dulled down. We can have, thankfully no longer have those conversations. What do you think consumer tech is now doing to culture in this part of the world? I think uh, consumer tech is uh, like making us better or worse consumers. So <laughs> it's, we live in, we live in a, in a culture that's heavy on consumerism and uh, you know you could see it offline and online so it's it's by no coincidence that you know we have in the world the largest in the region the largest consumption of youtube videos uh, for instance in saudi arabia or twitter uh, as well like per per country um, it's it's still like you know if you look at the the impact I think we were just using tech as, as consumers. Very few uh, innovation has been, uh, you know, started in the region in terms of uh, disruptive technology that could impact society or, you know, uh, life in general. There are some examples here and there, you know, a few entrepreneurs that have not are not looking at, you know, what is working in the States, in the Silicon Valley, or in Europe, and just importing it and localizing it, which is good. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, a bad thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's a way of uh, creating value uh, by, by pr uh, providing a certain service or uh, uh, serving a certain market. But in terms of, you know, hardcore innovation that can have a massive impact, whether in the region and or globally, the cases are very few. So, Hala told me something which chilled my blood this morning. He, talking about this post-Arab Spring moment in, in, in tech, he said, the revolutions were fantastic user acquisition strategy for Twitter. Not strategy, it just happened. <laughs> it's not that they, they like, uh, they intentionally drove it, but uh, I mean, if I was Twitter and I would see like, you know, how my, uh, the, the, the hockey stick I got in, in Egypt during the, uh, the Arab Spring, it's, it's, let's call it a lucky moment. Blog, there, was a, there was a time at the beginning of blogging when it, Farsi was the second most common language in the blogosphere. There was a time when Twitter and Facebook were used for revolution you've just described consumer technology as making us better consumers which in, in a sense gets us to this point of asking whether really anything anything has changed one way of asking whether anything has changed has been to question one of the premises of the startup revolution which is that um, you know what anybody can do it it's the rags to riches stories that we all hear and yet Bill Gates was called Trey by his family. Trey because he was the third. And they didn't even call him the third, they called him Trey, which is some kind of, I don't know, fake Latin. I, um, Mark Zuckerberg went to Phillips Academy, which I think is the kind of Eton for Englishmen um, of America, and, um, and claimed that he spoke ancient Greek and Latin on his Harvard forms. That's from Wikipedia, who knows whether it's true. Um, so. If you look at the, the world here, do you think that 
technology is providing genuine opportunities for change to a completely dim different demographic of people, that it's, it's allowing the kind of social mobility that it, everybody claims that it can? So I strongly believe that technology as a platform can do that anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about it. Like, you know, in terms of uh, uh, basics and, and concepts, uh, everything is uh, more democratized and accessible than it uh, ever was. And anyone with, you know, a brain and will and internet can do theoretically anything. The challenge, I think, is, you know, when you move from the concept and, and the initial product idea to building a business, I think this is where it becomes tricky and this is where class might be a favor or not. So, again, this is, like you started, a topic that's not discussed a lot uh, in the region and I think even uh, worldwide. And uh, part of that is because there's not enough data that says, you know, if you are rich and you come from a wealthy background, you would be a better entrepreneur or not. So there isn't evidence. But I can tell you some of the numbers that we have from, our, from one of our largest uh, research studies that we did uh, to date. And we had interviewed around 750 entrepreneurs and close to 250 experts, so investors and mentors and, and all that in the region. Uh, in tech and other than tech, and I will share some of the data that we found and then answer the question. So in that data, 75% uh, of people who started a business have used their own personal savings uh, to start the business. More than half of them had also um, uh, access to friends and family funding and support. Um, and then you have those who had mentors, so senior people helping them or coaching them, they had three, th three times more of those who had access to mentors were able to access angel investors compared to those who don't. 2.5 times, so uh, like two, twice and more, more access to uh, corporate partnerships. Right. So, if, it's, so, so it's business so, as usual. So it's, it is business as usual. So in other words, if you're connected, you, you reach people, money, and, and opportunity. So, so can this I, can doesn't say if you are from a certain socioeconomic background, you will make it. But if these numbers are like, you know, represent reality, then we know that anyone who comes from a privileged socioeconomic background has access to a wider safety net as a person a wider safety net and a pool of cash as a family that they can draw from. It's not that you know they would draw from, but, but when you start a business, you know, you're subject to a lot of vulnerabilities and risks, and you know, at one point you might die if you don't pay salaries, and then this reserve might be useful. And the people you know, so uh, your father's friends and cousins and you know, your network, your social network, is your potential mentors, partners, initial customers, and they would introduce you to their networks. So it's, it's, a, it's a way where you know, uh, the, the, the network dynamics play to your favor. However, there are cases where you know, we, there were entrepreneurs that have absolutely
it plays into that. Schumann gestured to it in his introduction. There is a kind of bubbling terror that a lot of us have, that at a certain point, not only will this famous thing called the singularity occur when um, computers are able to are cleverer than we are and then build even cleverer. I think, I mean, initially, technology were, were looked at as an opportunity, okay? So, um, yes, there is some job dis destruction that happens, but if you look at tech in, uh, in general, if you look in the region, it's one of the most scalable ways to create jobs. So, because the region is lagging, there is, there is one way to look at it on a regional level, so in the region, if you want to create jobs, you need something that scales fast, you need platforms, technology-based technology platforms are proven to be the most scalable ones, and you would solve the problem. But when we say technology on the regional level, we're talking like a couple of, a decade behind. Right. Now, if we go on, on the uh, higher level of technology, I was reading the other day that uh, a graph that economists look at a lot, which is uh, productivity. So usually economists love to look at productivity and compare it with uh, jobs. So for the first time in history, productivity has increased while jobs have decreased. And that says a lot. Uh, again, a couple of days ago, I, saw about, I, I was uh, reading about that hotel, in, uh, prototype hotel in Japan uh, called Henna. Uh, that is totally, totally managed and serviced by robots. And the, the people behind it want to create a chain of these hotels, and the room will average $75. So, yes, there will be a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of jobs, especially uh, on, on the low-skill kind of um, uh, level, will be dest destroyed by, uh, by technology. And what you mentioned about singularity, sometimes, you know, when, when I'm thinking, I, I believe it's, it's a plausible scenario, but I have another scenario that we, we are stupid enough, terribly bad before singularity happens, and we might slow down the entire thing by going a couple of centuries <laughs> uh, back. Through, because, I mean, and, and I know we will, we will touch upon this, you know, uh, the, the data, the risk of data, uh, cyber crime, and all this. I believe that, you know, we are today going on a certain trend with technology, but in my opinion, uh, World 3 will happen on the cyberspace, and I think it will, delay, it will, it will impact a lot of, uh, of that uh, course. So you're optimistic. That's great. Um, <laughs> I, there is very, very quickly. There are sort of three trends that that, that I, I wanted to, to to throw at you. The first is to think of the 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 web as um, a, a century later equivalence of what happened to the railroads or oil in in the U.S. in the 19th century. There was a huge rush of investment into oil into into the railroads in the 1860s. Yeah. Um, and by the 1890s, I think Mr. Mellon owned all of it. Ditto with oil from the 1850s onwards, Mr. Rockefeller. Today, the billions and billions and billions and billions of 
of, of, of dollars poured into the internet, and there are essentially four companies. So is there, do we need to do something about that? Where does the state come in? Th trend one. Trend two, I can't help but think that um, tech is still very much at, driven for the time being by human desires and greeds and fears and concerns. Um, but I just feel that what's happened by, with technology is it's accelerated all these processes. So that permanent tension between empowerment and democracy is balanced with sort of control and perhaps even enslavement when we talk of surveillance and privacy encroachments, etc. It's just happening faster than we've ever been able to identify before. And the third is, and maybe this links all of it, or the, the, the previous two together, there's this fascinating historical shift between the California that invented the web, a California of hippies, San Francisco, 10 minutes before the invention of, 10, 10 minutes before the internet and the web moved to San Francisco, it was Haight-Ashbury. And today, so anarchic, profoundly liberal, open sharing. Um, and those, th that culture exists, but exists, I think, in ever smaller pockets. Because today, if you looked at, if you, if you read the, the, the culture coming out of Silicon Valley, it's very much driven by a kind of libertarianism of Peter Thiel and Paul Allen and others which is profoundly antisocial. It doesn't believe in anything like a community. It's only about the individual. It's, it's Ayn Rand with, um, on, 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 on fiber. Um, that's a fascinating trajectory, and one I find terrifying. Where do you want me to start? <laughs> so tell us we're going to have World War III and we won't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, like a, a hack I came up with. <laughs> Keep it simple. No, uh, um, so again, uh, I think technology as a tool is, is fascinating uh, and, and there is still a lot that has to be done and Peter Thiel, uh, among like, the things he says, is that technology is broken because there are fields where you would expect technology to have done a lot. It's still failing to do the minimum. Healthcare is, is one, uh, one of uh, these examples. So. There is a lot that we can bet on from technology, and we could use it to fantastic ends. And this is where you know, having all the attention and the money and the venture capital flowing might be uh, a good thing, okay? Uh, now, in terms of comparing it to other industrial revolutions, it is an industrial revolution. And going back to the jobs uh, question, one might argue that the same way other industrial revolutions destroyed some jobs but created more value-add jobs, this is what technology would do. And it's possible. So I, I really don't care if a robot is servicing my room, if smarter jobs and more value-add things are, are created and you know, t education evolves properly or you know, gets unconventional to cope with these new areas that are still unserved and you know somebody creates uh, a way to uh, you know uh, an early diagnosis for cancer while you're at home instead of you know waiting three months later to discover that uh, you, you, you had cancer four months ago and you had absolutely no clue so I I'm not with looking at technology as you know this bad thing uh, it's some applications of technology that have bad implications. It's, you know, taking it a uh, couple of levels down, exposing all your life on Facebook and then uh, complaining that, you know, there's no privacy on the web. Uh, what, what do we expect in, in, in that case? Like, you know, there are things that we as consumers are able to circumvent, and there are others that are just, you know, uh, forces you have to cope with. And I don't think it's in anybody's hand to go and, and change that aspect that where you said, you know, like the, the full control or, you know, few companies owning the entire uh, data and controlling lives and all that. If, if somebody has a problem with that, they should at least change their behavior there because I don't, I personally cannot think of a way to beat that. You know, this is where it is going. 
it's a fact, you know, it's just a fact. It's, it's a, call it a new way of government, call it a new way of power. Maybe in a few generations, the, 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 the concept of power will change from governments to, you know, whoever owns data or runs these uh, webs uh, or, or platforms. Uh, but there isn't much, you ask, if, if we can do something about that. There are initiatives here and there, but this is where, where the world is going. I think we've got 10 minutes. I think we've got 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Bef while you formulate uh, your questions, I'm going to throw the first one in. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of months ago, a company that many of us hadn't heard about, I hadn't really heard about, uh, became one of the most valuable companies in the world, Alibaba, yeah. in China, and made Jack Ma, its founder, the richest man in, in, in China, which is now a country that has more oligarchs than, 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 uh, than America. Um, now, there are, there are certain structural reasons why Alibaba is a, is a success and will continue to be a success, while we're seeing the evisceration of the middle class in Europe. Um, the, the, the Chinese authorities are basically attempting to do the opposite, to move at least a quarter of a billion people from countryside to, to cities, and in doing so, um, basically, at a scalar level, you know, grow the, grow the middle class who are going to need uh, all the things that China probably once produced, which will, they'll probably outsource to middle America because it will be cheaper to produce there than it will be in China. My question is, are there, are there any structural qualities uh, to, the, to the Arab world that will see its um, tech industry or its tech innovators um, in a way be able to detach themselves from, the, from basically the Silicon Valley narrative that has led things so far? I think what's so fascinating about Alibaba and the other Chinese companies, none of which many of us have heard of, but whose, whose profit shares and whose, whose growth rates are outdoing almost everyone that we, that we do know. And again, given that where we are is literally geographically somewhere in the middle between these two poles, is there, is there anything particular to this part of the world that's allow, going to allow the companies that you know, the companies that you work with, to not necessarily replicate what's happening in, in China, but in a sense detach and, and create their own kind of m momentum and, and market here? If, if they want to reach anywhere near that, they will have to detach from, from this part of the world. Because if you look at Alibaba, you know, the, main, the main asset they have is the market. You know, it's, it's, it's China. And uh, that market here is, is actually the worst. So China is the best case scenario. It's when you have one huge market that talks one language, no boundaries, consumers with uh, certain buying power. It's just really, to a certain extent, the best case scenario. Here you have the worst case scenario. You have 22 countries with small population here and there. Uh, Internet penetration is becoming, you know, at par with, uh, you know, uh, its global benchmark. But uh, e-commerce adoption, buying online, credit card penetration, and all that in many of these countries, especially those that have uh, sizable uh, population, is not there. So definitely, it's not market that is going to uh, to be what will make the next big success story of the region. Um, in the region, it, it will just be, you know, uh, a, a, not a copycat, but an implementation, a custom, a, a localization of one of these platforms, just like Souk today is, you know, the largest uh, tech startup. It's not a startup anymore, but tech play, uh, close to a billion dollars soon. It will be probably the first billion dollar company uh, in the years to come. Uh, there's nothing you know, uh, extraordinary about uh, about Zook, except the fact that they were able to figure out the way to scale within these boundaries, within the, all the frictions that come from uh, the, the, the state of the Arab, uh, of the Arab world. Uh, others will have to detach and, you know, you will always need an ecosystem. So if, if you get out of here, you will need an ecosystem where if you have a good 
uh, idea and the ability to execute it and a good market for it, you need an ecosystem to feed from. And most likely, they will end up in Silicon Valley, most likely. Can I add one very short point to, to that, which is that I think one of the things which most impacts on uh, development cultures is the funding models. And one of the interesting things about venture capital, of course, is that as soon as you take venture capital, you commit to sell. You commit to an exit. It can be a public exit. They're very, very few and far between. But it, it breeds a kind of frenzy amongst companies, and also, certainly in Silicon Valley, and now very much in Europe as well, a kind of an in, very incestuous sort of pool. And um, who knows? Venture capitalists spend all their time talking about networks, these network effects. In, in, in any other in, in industry, those are called monopolies. <laughs> um, and uh, the drive for network effects has been, is, is also very much a VC-driven kind of thing. So I wonder whether China has its own particular funding models, an enormous amount of funding for new initiatives. The Kuwait Fund that you talked about earlier, $5 billion. That is a state funder. What will state funding, what will these massive sovereign wealth funds engaging in technology have as an impact on the tech that they're building? That sounds, I mean, that's, that may be also an answer. Um, two quick questions, uh, Rana. Um, first, can you tell us about uh, the, the, uh, the current state of you know, online connectivity uh, speeds in the, in the Arab world, how much are they of a hindrance? You think of country like Lebanon, where the population is very creative, uh, the internet infrastructure is really, really poor. And, and second of all, um, to, um, you know, through all your work, and do you believe that all these successes that we're seeing, are they having an impact on Arab governments to change the uh, legislation to make it easier for people to start online businesses? Maybe you can talk about the Kuwait Fund uh, in your discussion with the Kuwaiti government, are, they, uh, are you also bringing up the legislation uh, yeah. Um, changes? Yeah, okay, so uh, to start with the connectivity, uh, yeah, I mean, internet in Lebanon is a known, uh, is a known disaster. And uh, it, it does, I mean, I don't have the, the, the number in, in, my, uh, in my mind, but it's well known that, you know, every additional, uh, megabyte uh, of uh, of speed connect of connectivity speed will impact the country's GDP uh, like by one per, by 0.1 percent or something. So Lebanon suffers a lot. It is a creative country, but I can tell you there are a lot of anecdotes from those who made it, who just you know joke about it, and they still found out a way around it. So it's not that it's disastrous. It's just like frustrating. I don't think it would prevent anyone serious from pursuing their startup. Uh, example is Angami, is you know all the, the great things that are happening in Lebanon. I'm sure they all suffered and they all had to download the latest iOS 10 times until they were able to figure it out. God, God help them. Uh, in terms of legislation, uh, what is a fact is that all the governments in the region are looking at entrepreneurship as a serious alternative or a way out from many trouble, troubles. Now, how far are they going into changing legislation varies, okay? So until a few years ago, if you had to start a small company in Dubai, for instance, you had to incur upfront something like $20,000 between licensing and uh, you know, renting an office and having the first visas. Uh, to the, a couple of years ago, they launched N5, which is an incubator in, in TCOM, which is the largest uh, free zone. And everybody used to blame TCOM that this is just a real estate uh, play which is to a certain extent true, but nobody could have imagined that there will be this opportunity for innovative startups to come to Dubai and get started with 5,000 dirham. And it happened. And then when TCOM were able to break it, now you have five like them in Dubai that, can, that offer very affordable startup packages for tech innovative companies coming in Dubai. So this is an example of loosening up in some cases. In others, 
it's less easy, you know, when it comes to workforce, mainly. Uh, you know, and, and especially in, in the Gulf, in all the states of the Gulf, it's very, uh, there are a lot of um, not super entrepreneurial friendly uh, legislation that prevents people from easily hiring whoever they want. And talent is the most important thing in running a startup, is as important as the team who's doing it and the money. It's talent. And in many states where, you know, you, if, if you need to hire one expat, you need to get five uh, uh, nationals. And here we are trying to work with corporations. So we are looking at companies like GE, for instance, who is already very advanced in Internet of Things or industrial internet or uh, renewable energy and say, you know, you care a lot about the local context and the local supply chain and it's only with people like you that this will happen. So let's come up with a program whereby you support, invest, scale, give market opportunities, train these people. Last question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, in regards to what you were talking about, the essentially the automation of labor, so even Uber drivers who are uh, working below the API, so working with interfaces, and that economy, at one point, people are saying are going to be replaced by automated cars. And I like what you said about um, then that creating even better jobs, smarter jobs, more engaging jobs. But for people who maybe can't catch up with that, is something like uh, basic income um, or redistribution of a basic income being discussed at all within a business model? Not, not in the region. Like, <laughs> not not <because> anywhere. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just, not, just not anywhere. I, I read an article by Paul, Paul Graham. It was, it's, it's quite old. It must be three or four years old, where he was trying to explain why it's normal for somebody to be paid, um, I think, a thousand times the national average in the US. Um, and his answer was because their ideas are better and they work harder. And that, so that increasingly has become a, it's not at all a blanket description of what's going on in California or in London or in Berlin or in these new tech hubs, but there is this, I think, real culture shift, which has left society out of it, when what's so fascinating about the web is that, about the internet, sorry, about the internet, is that it emerges out of free publicly funded, or publicly funded education programs, and then is taken up and spread by a, a, a network of very happy, socially minded educationalists, philosophers, um, anarchists, I mean, <laughs> It's an amazing journey, a very, very short period of time. Fantastic. At which point, we're going to have to end this session. Thank you so much to Roland. Thank you so much to Turi.